Hi everyone, how are you doing today? I hope that things have been treating you well since we last talked, and if not, let's spend some time looking at some books <laughs> to distract ourselves. Um, yeah, it's been a crazy couple of months for me, honestly. Haven't gotten back into the groove of making videos, but I am looking forward to sharing some reading updates here books that I finished recently, books I'm currently reading, and books on the horizon. So let's start with the uh, the chunkster here. I'm going to move some of these things over a little bit. So um, I've just recently finished Christine, Kristen Lovren's Daughter by Sigrid Unset. Wow, a book that I've been reading on and off for about two and a half years. Um, my Reading Buddy and I have been going through books from around the world, and uh, we decided to tackle <laughs> this uh, book that's over a thousand pages for Norway. It's uh, one of the great works of their country, so it, it just made sense, honestly. Uh, Sigrid Unset actually won the Nobel Prize for this book in 1928, and it was originally published in three installments in uh, 19, 20, 21, and 22, I believe. And so we've been reading it about 100 years since then, almost to the date, uh, not quite, but nearly. So we read uh, the first part, which is called The Wreath. That was back in October 2020. And some of you may remember I did a little video on it back then wasn't really into it, but we we kept going. <laughs> so we read The Wife in May of 2021, took a big, big break, and then finished with The Cross uh, early this month. So honestly, I think this really deserves its own video, its own follow-up video on the last two books in this trilogy. Um, I wouldn't say that I love this book, but I was able to really appreciate it more as I got further into it. I think the first book just sets up the story and the second two books flesh out the story um, as we see what happens to Kristen and her family after she makes her fateful choices in the first book. Um, yeah, so lots, lots going on here, lots of characters drama, romance, uh, politics, lots of immersion in medieval Norway where this takes place. Yeah, I, I can't say that any of the characters left a great impression on me. I think there was one character I liked and that one died, uh, <laughs> died quickly. <laughs> and then, you know, you're kind of left kind of following these really unpleasant people for again, a thousand pages, but um, Unset does a pretty good job of making you care about the characters. They seem very real, very consistent in the right ways and spontaneous in the right ways. And I don't know, I just um, just thought that this writing is really good. I can see why she won the Nobel Prize as historical fiction. It's very immersive and gave me a real window into this time period and how um, people lived back then, how it was like to grow up as a, a woman in this time period. Always, I think, um, very, uh, like, like holistically, this book does a good job of highlighting the culture and expectations of, I think this is what, 1300s Norway? Um, something like that. Um, so yeah, all together, you know, this is a big commitment for a book, and I would say you really do need to read the whole thing. It's kind of like The Lord of the Rings. You can't just read, you know, The Fellowship of the Ring. You have to read all three books because this is a very big, big story. Um, yeah, so I think I'll have more to say on this if you're interested. Uh, let me know in the comments. Um, that, was, that was kind of the biggest reading update of recent weeks. All right, so I'm reading a couple of books for the season of Lent which um, I've been trying to observe this year. Um, so I've got a couple of books for that. First one I read was uh, Humility by Gavin Ortland, 
the joy of self-forgetfulness is the subtitle here. And indeed, I liked his approach to the topic of humility. It's a very short little book, but he covers it from a variety of angles. Our humility in reference to God, in reference to other people, in reference to leadership, and just, you know, how to be healthily humble, not self-deprecating, not beating yourself up. Um, and yeah, I just thought this was a very well-written little book, very convicting and pretty, like it, it comes at this from so many different angles. I really did like that. I'm a big fan of his channel, by the way, check it out. It's called Truth Unites. And um, I think right now he's uh, pretty, pretty into the Catholic Protestant dialogue, but um, he also does a lot of videos on just, you know, Christianity in general. He wrote a really good book called Why God Makes Sense in a World That Doesn't, which I think I've mentioned a couple of times as a book of apologetics. This was great. This was a wonderful way to start my Lenten reading. Um, also, for Lent, I am reading Confessions by St. Augustine. In all honesty, uh, <laughs> I haven't gotten very far. Um, hmm. I'm trying to see. Yeah, I think I'm only like maybe... 20 pages at best into this, but to be fair, I did read the introduction of this one first. I don't usually read introductions of books because I don't like, I don't like how they often casually drop spoilers or tell you what you should be thinking about in the book. I just really don't enjoy, enjoy that. But this was a good introduction from Oxford World's Classics. Um, this translations by Henry Chadwick, whoever he may be. He, uh, okay, it says, he's, he's been affiliated at different times with Cambridge, Oxford, or at least Oxford uh, publications, like, like this one. <laughs> so anyway, I did really like the introduction. It was helpful to get an idea of Augustine's life and how he came to write the confessions. And some of it I already knew from a friend who had told me about what to expect with this. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just taking this very slowly. I don't think I'm going to finish it by the end of Lent because we're already a couple of weeks in. But I'm just going to read it at whatever pace I can read it and um, glean what I can from it. Um, so kind of excited to be reading this monumental work of uh, Christian theology and philosophy as well. Um, so let's see, um, I'm reading one or two other things that I, I'm not gonna show here, um, but they're essays by uh, Aldous Huxley who wrote Brave New World and um, I'm reading them for my war and pacifism reading project, which I talk about on my blog. Check that out if you're interested. Um, but basically, the collection of essays I'm reading right now is called Ends and Means, and it is about um, how he's, like, his recommendations for society, basically. And, you know, with all such kinds of books, it's very, uh, very idealistic, but I am enjoying the bent of his arguments so far. Granted, it was written, like, I want to say... I want to say it was published in the 30s, so, you know, some of his information might be a bit outdated, but I am enjoying it. I think I just need to get back into it, because after reading Christine Lovren's Daughter, I had this slight book hangover, and it was hard to get back into the books I had been reading up till that point, so, um, yeah, there will be more to say about that later. Let's talk about some new books that I have gotten recently. So, oh, wait a minute. Before I get into the new books, one other book I'm reading right now is uh, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. This is for a read-along that I'm part of. And I had this novel on my shelf for quite some time. I got this at the thrift store. I just really like this edition, honestly. It's so elegant. And... I uh, never really gave it a try. I have read The Waves before and A Room of One's Own. Really liked both of those. 
So this is about a lady who is getting ready to host a party. And so far, it's kind of following, well, it's it's day in the life. So, you know, we, we meet Clarissa Dalloway, and she's going to buy flowers at the flower shop. But there's so much more going on than that. She's thinking about people she used to know, problems in her life, um, what she sees in the street as cars are going by and stuff. And yeah, this is, I love this kind of writing. I like this kind of story, frankly. It's just very cozy <laughs> and yet also very moving so far, just in these little moments where uh, Virginia Woolf has so eloquently described what it's like to kind of be in your head as you're going about your day-to-day -day life. And I just think it's really good writing. I'm actually getting echoes of Joseph Conrad in this because Conrad does co some of that too in some of his first person narrated books. Um, but here it's on full display with Virginia Woolf and her like stream of consciousness kind of writing. This isn't even as stream of consciousness as the waves, but it's um, in that general zone. So yeah, more to say about that I'm sure later on. Yeah, so I guess I will go ahead and talk about the new books that I've gotten recently, and then at the end I'll talk about another book that I'm reading. But uh, yeah, so I had a couple of people get me books recently. Um, somebody got me Anderson's Fairy Tales from my book list, so thank you so much for that. I am a big fan of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales, and I just, they're just so human and so beautiful and bittersweet, so I'm looking forward to rereading some of my favorites from here and also reading some that I haven't read yet. Um, there's a couple titles here I don't recognize, so that's gonna be fun. And then Nigel, my brother, got me the letters of T.E. Lawrence from a library sale, um, edited by Malcolm Brown. And I teased this on one of my shorts, but I am so excited about this. I wasn't even looking for it, but just, uh, he, he saw that and he knew that I needed to get, have this one. I have quite an extensive T.E. Lawrence collection in case, uh, you didn't know. Uh, older, viewers probably remember I did a whole video about T.E. Lawrence. Yeah, this has letters from much of his career in life in here, and I was just flipping through it and already really nerding out at some of the references to other authors that he mentions, um, references to classical composers. I was kind of looking towards at the end of the letters, but yeah, this will be so much fun to read. Um, I'm going to take my time with it. I'm a huge fan of reading old letters, and I'll have more to say about that in a minute, but um, yeah, very excited about that one. Okay, other new books. I've been, I mean, pretty, <laughs> pretty careful, I'd say, in the last few months, but I think I have acquired a few things here that well, some of them maybe not have been planned. So I got this one. This one actually was planned, and I'm going to try to fit this into my Lenten reading if I can. It's uh, Philosophy, A Very Short Introduction by Edward Craig. Um, a lot of people have been recommending these very short introductions. By uh, These are also Oxford published, so they have, you know, titles on all kinds of subjects. So I got philosophy because I think it is a very important topic adjacent to and overlapping with Christianity. So again, the, the Lenten reading there. And then I also got the Cold War. I found this one secondhand. I have learned about the Cold War in college, but I thought, why don't I get this and see if I, you know, if it's all old stuff or if I'm learning anything. I've already learned some things, <laughs> so that's that's been fun. I got a bookmark here, too. This is Monet's um, Water Lilies bookmark. Yeah, <laughs> so pretty. Anyway, uh, this is a neat little book, too. And this one has... It's just nicely formatted, I've got to say. Like, you've got photographs, maps, little call-out boxes. 
So just kind of geeking out over the format of these books, but also enjoying this one too. I need to get back into this though, because I started it thinking I'd read it in a week and then I kind of switched over to fiction for a bit, but yeah. Um, the Cold War. And then another book I picked up on that trip to the bookstore is um, The Warrior's Life by Alfred de Vigny. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Somebody can correct me because I'm not sure. But this is a memoir of a soldier who fought in the Napoleonic Wars and thought this would also be really good for my war and pacifism reading project. And uh, I'd never heard of it before, even though i am kind of been interested in the Napoleonic Wars for some time. The Warrior's Life is superficially considered a book the least likely to appeal to a modern reader of English. <laughs> I don't know how they come up with some of these... Um, introductions I, I just it's it's very amusing i think that this sounds very interesting but then again maybe i'm not your average reader of english so we'll see i thought this would be nice to pair with another book that i have already which is on war um and this uh this was written by a, a prussian officer so these two would really i think be good to read together because one's about a soldier looking back on the war from that more human perspective. And then I think this is more of like, I want to say it's like a strategy book. At least that's my understanding. So we shall see. But yeah, having kind of two sides of the same coin would be quite interesting. And then I was really excited by this find. Again, secondhand store. Um, but... I found a copy of War and Peace, and believe it or not, I didn't have a copy of War and Peace. Camera, focus, focus. Hello? Okay, so I found this beautiful copy of War and Peace. This is the same edition as Christine Lovren's daughter that I showed you earlier. This is a Penguin Deluxe paperback that has deco edges. I just learned recently these are called French flaps where they have it folded in like that, the more you know. Um, this is in great condition, honestly, for a book that has been read before. It's got a pretty significant crease in the spine, but I was quite happy to get it for half price. And this is the Anthony Briggs translation. I have read his... Um, I have read his translation of Eugene Onyegin. It wasn't one of my favorites, but it was fine... It had a certain uh, zest to it that I might need for a book that's this long, honestly. So I'm not sure when I'm going to read this because I wasn't even planning to read it anytime soon, but I just had to go ahead and get it because um, for a deal like that and for this format, it's just can't be beat. I really did enjoy reading the Penguin Deluxe version of Kristen Lauren's Daughter. So I'm, I'm really a paperback person and uh, these are particularly well designed for from an ergonomic perspective and, and an aesthetic perspective too. Those are the books I have recently purchased. I have a few library books here that I'm going to show you as well. Um, these first two I actually have read already. So this is a book of poetry called What the Chickadee Knows by Margaret Newton Poems in Anishina, Bamoan, and English. Let me just read this little bit here for some context. So Anishina, Bamoan is the language of uh, three of these tribes centered in the Great Lakes region. Um, I won't read what the tribes are, but you can look them up because I'm pretty sure I'll mispronounce them terribly. Uh, this language is currently used in more than 200 Anishinaabe communities in Quebec, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, North Dakota, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Like many indigenous languages, its vitality is precarious. Although some of our most beloved elders and teachers left us in recent years, the number of speakers is beginning to hold steady. So, 
um, this, I believe she's a professor, has written these poems in this language and also in English. And so, I mean, I just, I, I think I did read one of them using the pronunciation guide in its original language, but for the most part, I just read these in English. And I thought these were very beautiful poems, actually. I mean, I wouldn't say they're like my most favorite poems I've ever read or anything, but I thought they were very poignant, calming, very evocative of the scenery. And, you know, some of them actually cover some very sad topics, but in a very contemplative way. They're not like, uh, they're not really like shocking or harsh in the way that they're portraying their message. And I just really appreciated that. I wasn't really I wasn't really in the mood for any poetry that was going to be too, um, I guess, you know how some poetry can be very in your face. This wasn't like that. This was really tasteful and um, elegant poetry. So I liked this quite a bit. I love this cover, I've just got to say. So um, yeah, if you're interested in indigenous poetry, why not Why not give this a, a read? It's, it's short and it's also uh, just a nice way to unwind honestly and and learn about someone else's perspective um, another book of poetry i checked out at the library is this book called so far so good by ursula k Le, Le Guin. i feel bad i should know how to say her name she's a famous science fiction author i actually haven't read her yet either um so you know double double bad on my part i think she wrote a trilogy called Earth Sea or something like that. And uh, these are the last poems that she wrote, possibly even her last book before she passed away in 2018. So, um, I honestly didn't like these as much, if I'm being honest. Um, they weren't bad, they just didn't really resonate with me. And sometimes I felt I don't know, they felt kind of, I don't know, it's kind of hard to describe how I feel about these poems, but I really didn't enjoy them that much. Um, but a lot of people did like this, like they're very highly rated, I think, on Goodreads, so check it out if that's something that interests you. I will say her style is very accessible. Again, there's no like weirdness really, it's just I didn't personally resonate with these poems, or they didn't resonate with me, so... Um, it's an okay collection. I just, yeah, wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Um, but anyway, last but not least, I've got, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, Welcome to the Monkey House. This is a collection of his short stories somebody recommended to me. So I will be, or at least they recommended a couple of stories from this collection. So I will be giving this a read. Believe it or not, I've never read Kurt Vonnegut. So this is also a first. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be that's kind of exciting, you know, like recently I I had a uh, first with Murakami and that didn't go too well, but uh, let's hope we have a little bit better better luck with this one. Um, yeah, now last thing I wanted to go over here is a book I am reading. I'll show it on the screen. This is Letters to Felice by Franz Kafka. I say by Franz Kafka, but they're his letters, okay? Like, <laughs> um, he didn't write them for publication. And I think I talked about this briefly before in another video, so I won't go over it in detail, but there's actually a really good introduction in the beginning of this book that talks about, you know, the nature of publishing Franz Kafka and, you know, the controversy behind that. But in any case, I'm reading it. I mean, I didn't stop me, if I'm being honest. And I am finding it really interesting. It's very Kafka-esque in the sense that his letters are full of the same kind of anxiety, paranoia, absurdity, comedy, and tragedy that you find in his books. And I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. I think it's a little bit stronger than I even realized it would be. Uh, but it's been very interesting. So Felice Bauer was a woman he met at a like randomly at his friend's house and then he started up a sort of long distance relationship with her over letters right um so they would like write to each other every day whether they had received a letter or not and it was uh so like 
the first, I don't know, maybe 20 to 50 letters. It seems like all they're doing, all he's doing anyway, because we only have his letters. Um, I think hers were lost, but we have his side of the letters. And I feel like most of the time he's just writing about how he wants her to write him a letter or how he sad he missed her letter or how her letter shook him. Like, <laughs> I don't know. There's, it's just uh, weird. <laughs> There's this whole phase at the beginning of their relationship where it's just pure anxiety and it's it's kind of hard to read actually. Like it's, I feel kind of, I feel bad for him. Um, it's, and if I were re receiving the letters, I'd be kind of disturbed. There was actually this whole um, drama where I think Felice did get kind of disturbed by his letters and had had the friend Max Broad, who by the way is the person who ended up publishing Kafka's writing, but tangent. Anyway, Felice got the mutual friend involved and the mother was involved and like it was it was quite a quite a drama there. So I don't know. Um it's very interesting. I think the most interesting part so far, well, apart from getting to know more about Kafka and his quirks, is that uh he was writing the novels the novel America during this time and he was also writing the Metamorphosis and these letters show the moment, effectively, when he had the idea to write the Metamorphosis and what events in his life um, kind of drove him to do that. And it's just so, like, I wasn't expecting that at all. I really wasn't. Um, it's really neat to have that context. It doesn't necessarily change. I mean, I, I already thought the Metamorphosis, like, if someone's going to ask me what my favorite book is, I don't like to give an answer to that. But I have to say, I have a really great fondness for the Metamorphosis after all these years and having read it probably more than any other book except Eugene Onegin. Um, and I still love Eugene Onegin, don't get me wrong. But what I'm trying to say here is that um, just getting the backstory to this moment of inspiration when Kafka wrote The Metamorphosis is just so fascinating. And hearing his you know, his life, his writing habits, his job frustrations. I mean, he just, he's a very real person and it's kind of comforting for anyone who's a creative to read that your favorite authors didn't necessarily write full-time. I mean, at this point in Kafka's life, he, he was not, he worked, he only worked six hours a day. So like, I'm still kind of jealous of him, but he was in the office six days, a, uh, six hours a day he had a, a regular job like the rest of us and he had to struggle with interruptions and family drama and all the stuff just like the rest of us. So it's kind of cool that, you know, he still managed to write at the level that he did and create something so groundbreaking, I would say, um, for his time. So yeah, Letters to Felice is being... Uh, it's quite a long read because they wrote so many letters. I think I'm only about 15% of the way through the book and it'll be due soon. So I've got to wait my turn again or, or get my own copy of it, but I am really enjoying it. And it's kind of a nice, um, kind of a nice palate cleanser between other reads, uh, because it's not like super serious. I mean, it is serious, but it's also kind of just, you know, letters. So I think that's all I wanted to share today. This was a rather long video, but I hope it was somewhat interesting or at least a way to pass the time. Uh, thanks for watching. Thank you to all those two who subscribed recently. It really, really makes my day and I hope you um, stay tuned. Uh, my, my upload schedule has been pretty erratic lately and it will probably be that way for a while yet, but I'm not giving up on the channel at this point, so... Uh, thank you for watching. I hope you have a good rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Bye.